Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Serial killers are more rare than popular culture would have us believe. Most murderers know their victims. Their deaths are not random. They haven't been unlucky enough to cross paths with a monster. They were unlucky to know a person who wanted to hurt them. But books, and movies especially, perpetuate the myth of the everyday boogeyman. And the fictional victim is the archetypal beautiful damsel in distress who was stalked and hunted until a final showdown. She will either meet her fate with a serial killer and die, or some criminal profiler will identify the monster just in time to save our damsel. But life isn't an episode of Criminal Minds. Real serial killers cannot always be put in a box and figured out. And let's face it, local law enforcement don't want to figure them out. They just want to stop them. So, in that brutal Memphis summer of 1969, police were at a loss. They worked with the press and the public, and details of the murders were in the papers in a way we no longer see. Making the boogeyman real in a way that was beginning to feel personal to Memphians. Instead of being scared, they were getting angry. Welcome to episode 197, Memphis serial killer George Howard Putt, part two. From 1962 to 1964, a serial killer had a death grip around the bustling metropolis of Boston, Massachusetts. This killer was accused of sexually assaulting and murdering at least 11 women in the Boston area, and he had several distinct MOs. All of his victims were female. Most of them were between the ages of 65 to 85. He'd usually convince them to open their door willingly so there were no signs of forced entry, and he often strangled them to death with a pair of nylon stockings. Afterward, he would sometimes tie those stockings in a bow around his victims' necks. You've probably heard of this killer before. The media dubbed him the Boston Strangler. And for two long years, Massachusetts was plagued by his threatening presence. In 1965, 34-year-old Albert DeSalvo confessed to the crimes of the Boston Strangler. He claimed that he had sexually assaulted and killed Anna Slessers, Mary Mullen, Nina Nichols, Helen Blake, Ida Erga, Jane Sullivan, Sophie Clark, Patricia Bissett, Mary Brown, Beverly Sammons, Evelyn Corbin, Joanne Graff, and Mary Sullivan. Only five of these women were around 20 years old. The rest of the 13 victims were ages 65 to 85. It's not clear if DeSalvo actually committed all of these heinous acts. Many believe he was lying about committing at least some of them. But at the time of his confession, DeSalvo was already sentenced to life in prison for being a serial rapist. As a result, he was never formally tried or convicted of any Boston Strangler-related crimes. DeSalvo died in prison in 1973. Later, in 2013, his DNA was definitively linked to the rape and murder of the last known victim of the Boston Strangler, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, who died on January 4th of 1964. Five years later, in 1969, another serial killer would walk the streets, but not the streets of Boston. This time it was Memphis, Tennessee. Over a span of 29 days, the perpetrator killed five people, 58-year-old Roy Dumas, 47-year-old Bernalyn Dumas, 82-year-old Layla Jackson, 21-year-old Glenda Sue Harden, and, the focus of today's episode, 59-year-old Christine Pickens. And this Memphis serial killer had some notable similarities to the Boston Strangler. He also primarily targeted older women. He also always convinced his victims to open their door willingly. He also strangled them to death. And he also chose stockings as his weapon of choice for most of his murders. There were so many similarities between the two serial killers that experts on the Boston Strangler helped the Memphis police with their investigation. The Memphis newspapers constantly made comparisons between the two killers, 
and the author of the 1968 book, The Boston Strangler, Gerald Frank, even wrote a criminal profile on the Tennessee copycat for the Memphis Press Scimitar. The police went so far as to investigate any person who had checked out Frank's book on the Boston Strangler from the public library, though a journalist from the Commercial Appeal did point out that the paperback of the same book was available for a mere 95 cents at any newsstand. Not to mention, a movie had been created about the Boston Strangler, too. It felt like history was repeating itself, and I guess in a way, history was repeating itself but not in some big grand way like how newspapers used to frame serial killers. The Boston Strangler, Albert DeSalvo, was just an evil man. This serial killer from Tennessee was just one more evil man. And like all evil men, he fell flat on his face when a woman was given the smallest chance to fight back. Mary Christine Pickens was born on September 11, 1910, to her parents, William and Mary Pickens, in Tiptonville, Tennessee. Since Little Mary was named after her mother, a Mary Jr., if you will, she primarily went by her middle name, Christine. Her friends and family called her Chris. Christine had three half-siblings from her father's three previous marriages. Christine's mother, Mary, was William's fourth and last wife. Christine's father, William, was a reverend and a pastor. He worked at a variety of churches, including the Lambeth Memorial United Methodist Church in Jackson, Tennessee, about 70 miles south of Tiptonville, where Christine was born. You won't be shocked to hear that Christine, a pastor's daughter, was also very religious. She attended church every Sunday and was involved in all church activities her entire life. Christine spent most of her childhood and adolescence in Jackson, Tennessee. She graduated from Jackson High School in the 1920s. After that, she attended the University of Memphis Lambeth campus, which was also in Jackson. But when it came time for Christine to find a job, she knew that she needed somewhere different, somewhere with opportunity. So she moved from Jackson to Memphis. The two Tennessee cities aren't terribly far away from each other, about 85 miles total, an hour and a half's drive with traffic. But I bet to a young woman who had spent her whole life in Jackson, the journey to Memphis felt immense. But Christine was brave, and like all brave women, she figured it out. I'm not sure what Christine's life was like in her 20s. The information just isn't available. But I can tell you that Christine's father passed away in May of 1941. He was 79 years old. Christine was 30. And I'm sure that was a challenging time for her. Two years later, on November 28th of 1943, 33-year-old Christine Pickens married a man named Thomas Butler in Marion, Arkansas. At the time, Christine was the manager of the book department at Lowenstein's. She had worked there for several years. And Thomas was in the Navy. He was a machinist mate, first class. The young couple honeymooned in New Orleans, Louisiana, and then they moved to San Francisco, California, to start their lives together. That's where Thomas was stationed. And then one month later, Thomas died. Based on context clues and a few mentions of Thomas in the papers, he was probably overseas serving his country in World War II. Following her husband's untimely death, Christine reverted to her maiden name. That's why she's Christine Pickens and not Butler. But even though Christine preferred to use the name Pickens, she always maintained her status as a Mrs. and she never married again. In the early to mid-1950s, Christine worked as a receptionist at the Methodist Hospital. Her boss was a radiologist who always remembered how kind and sweet Christine was. She had a sharp sense of style, a quick wit, and a compassionate heart. When Christine's colleagues would bicker, she was quick to step away from the conflict. Around 1959, Christine left her job at Methodist Hospital to become a receptionist for Dr. Robert Armstrong. He was a dentist. She would work in his dental office for the next 10 years, and I'm sure Armstrong was very appreciative of that. Christine was an asset to his team, professionally and personally. He told the Commercial Appeal that Christine was incredibly supportive of the people around her. In September of 1969, 59-year-old Christine lived alone in a one-bedroom apartment, but she wasn't actually alone. She had friends, good friends, 
One such friend described Christine as helpful and funny. They told the commercial appeal, I remember her sitting up with a friend all night when her friend had surgery. She was just a good Christian girl that everybody loved. And the people who weren't Christine's friends, well, she still treated them like they were her friends anyway. One of her neighbors told the commercial appeal, she was one heck of a nice person. She was the kind of person who would bring you a bowl of soup if she knew you were sick. A man who worked across the hall from Christine said, I used to go get Cokes for her. She never let me pay for them. She was a lot of fun, sharp and on the ball. On Thursday, September 11th, 1969, it was Christine's 59th birthday, but she hadn't taken the day off. That wasn't her nature. Of course, she went into work, like always. She walked into Armstrong and Armstrong Dental Office at 8.30 that morning and waved at her apartment neighbor, who happened to work in the same building. As Christine sat in her office chair, everyone wished her a happy birthday, and she graciously but excitedly thanked them for the well wishes before getting straight to work. After all, Christine had a lot of patience that day. They always did on Thursdays, since the dental office closed at noon and wasn't open on Fridays. Christine didn't have time to grab a proper lunch, she was so busy. But that was usually the case at this fast-paced job. She would just sneak quick bites in in between patients. At noon, the office closed and Christine left her desk. A colleague asked her if she was headed home, and Christine replied, No, I've got an errand to run. I don't want to be in a hurry. You go on. Apparently, Christine was going to get a gift for Dr. Armstrong's soon-to-be-born grandchild. You know, just doing something nice for the people around her on her own birthday. Typical Christine things. Approximately one hour later, Christine was found dead in her home. There was no sign of forced entry, and there were three locks on her doors. One lock on her back door was brand new. She had added it in response to the murders of the Dumases, Layla Jackson, and Glenda Sue Harden. After the news of Christine's death broke, a receptionist who worked in the same building as Christine told the Memphis Press Scimitar, she had such a friendly smile. The last time I talked with her, we were talking about the murders. She said she wouldn't let anyone in her apartment that she didn't know. And a longtime friend of Christine's, Claude Jen, lamented to reporters about how he teased Christine about her caution. He joked, by the time a prowler gets in the front, you can get out the back. Christine's funeral service was held two days later at the Griffin Funeral Home in Jackson, Tennessee. She was buried in the Hollywood Cemetery in Jackson, just like her parents. And Christine's gravestone was inscribed with these words, she loved God, she loved life. I know what you're thinking. Where's the big to-do? The police, the investigation, the dusting for fingerprints. The quotes from our repeating guest stars, Fire and Police Director Holloman, police chief Lux. Well, you won't be hearing any of that because they caught the guy. It was 23-year-old George Howard Putt, and his long-awaited arrest was all thanks to Christine. George Howard Putt was born on March 15, 1946, to parents Ruth and Clifford Putt in New Orleans, Louisiana. His nickname was Buster, and he was the third oldest child out of at least six siblings, including four brothers and one sister. George's childhood was, by all accounts, terrible. It doesn't excuse the monster he would become, but it's definitely a part of his history. In 1943, three years before George was born, his father Clifford was drafted into the military at age 24. He was supposed to serve his country in World War II. But we don't know if he did, We do know that according to the Greensboro record, Clifford was investigated for being an army deserter. But I guess they found evidence indicating that he had been properly discharged. Later that year, Clifford was convicted of assault. He was fighting with his wife and George's future mother, Ruth. When the situation escalated, a man had stepped in. Clifford pulled a rifle on him and shot twice. Luckily, the rifle failed both times and then he tried to flee the scene but was apprehended by police. In 1946, the year George was born, his father was charged with cruelty to a juvenile in New Orleans. We're not sure who the juvenile was in that case, but it could have been baby George. According to George's grandfather, Clifford would beat his four-month-old son with his belt. In 
Clifford was sentenced to one year in jail, but it was suspended so long as he underwent treatment. And it appears that he did undergo treatment at the VA in North Carolina. In July of 1947, when George was one year old, Clifford pled guilty to fraud. He had knowingly made false statements about payments related to his service in the Army and somehow gotten money out of it. A few months later in November, Clifford was caught forging checks, and about 30 days later in December, he was charged with larceny. By the time Clifford turned 40, he was accused of check fraud in six cities. So yeah, George's dad was a bad guy. But what about mom? Unfortunately, Ruth was just as bad as Clifford. For a time, they were partners in crime. Clifford would give Ruth money for bus fare, and then Ruth would take all the kids to different cities in the area. In each city, she would pretend she was going to buy an item with a check made out for more than the item cost. For example, she paid $18 for a watch and handed the clerk a check for over $50. Then she got the watch and the remaining balance in cash. According to Ruth, they ran this scam in at least a dozen cities. And when she was caught, she said the whole thing was Clifford's idea. She said he forced her to forge checks day in and day out. I'm not sure I believe her. The court certainly didn't. Eventually, Ruth was sentenced to three to five years in prison in Greensboro. After that, she was to serve another sentence of up to 10 years for a different forgery conviction. By 1964, Clifford and Ruth divorced. They probably couldn't see each other anymore anyway. They were too busy serving prison sentences. Meanwhile, George and his siblings were shuffled between relatives, friends, and foster homes for the majority of their childhood. There are records of him living in New Orleans, Texas, North Carolina, Mississippi, and Virginia. And as you can imagine, that unstable, transient, no-parent childhood didn't go well. George started his rap sheet very early. At age 11, he was caught stealing an air rifle in Texas. Okay, you might be thinking, that's no big deal, no harm, no foul. And normally I'd agree, it was just an air rifle. But this was just the beginning for George. On July 26, 1961, 15-year-old George sexually molested a 10-year-old girl. On January 13, 1962, George, who was still 15, was accused of kidnapping a woman, holding her at gunpoint, and forcing her to drive to a secondary location. That woman, thank God, purposely wrecked the car and escaped. George was arrested. Two days later, George crawled through the second-story window of a home he had seen two women enter. He woke one of these women up and said, don't scream if you don't want anything to happen to your children. Then he forced her to dress and get in his car. Police caught him when George ran a red light. Luckily, they put a stop to him this time. I can't emphasize this enough. George was 15 years old, and these are just the crimes we know about. If teenage George was stalking women this boldly, these probably weren't his first violent crimes. He was definitely aware he could get away with it. The courts certainly weren't stopping him, not in any meaningful way. It wasn't until George was days away from turning 17 that the courts finally committed him to the Gatesville School for Boys in Gatesville, Texas. He was released four years later on March 15, 1967, his 21st birthday. In a perfect world, George would have spent those four years reflecting and rehabilitating, but he did not. Instead, he tried to escape the school and was accused of trying to rob the librarian with three other boys. Sometime during George's teen years, a psychiatrist determined that he was a psychopath. According to the commercial appeal, the psychiatrist said George was capable of committing almost any type of crime. As I was researching this case, I almost lost my damn mind reading articles that framed George as a product of his upbringing. It is difficult to feel sympathy when you know the brutality of his crimes. George made choices. He made decisions. And many people have rough childhoods. We are all products of our upbringing, good or bad. When 21-year-old George was released from the state school, he got a job as a hospital orderly in Houston, Mississippi. Then George moved to Tupelo, which was his father's hometown. His paternal grandparents still lived there and George stayed with them for a while until he got on his feet. George was actually hired at the Tupelo Medical Center. 
but then he was fired. He had stolen the wallet of the director of nurses. He was forced to give the money back and no charges were pressed. When folks at the Tupelo spoke to reporters later, one woman recalled that George tried to wear his sunglasses during his interview. They had to ask him to remove them. While in Tupelo, 21-year-old George married an 18-year-old woman he had met through family named Mary Ruth. By 1969, 23-year-old George and 20-year-old Mary Ruth had a son together. But they weren't a happy little family. Mary often complained that George was lazy and that he physically abused her. In addition to all that, the couple was in dire financial straits. In May of 1969, George was arrested by the Mississippi police. He had robbed someone. He pled guilty and his charge was reduced to trespassing. They fined him $500 and sentenced him to six months in the Hines County Penal Farm in Jackson, Mississippi. But apparently, George didn't think that his reduced sentence that he had literally pled guilty to was fair. So one day, when George was assigned to work detail outside, he just left hopped in a truck, and drove off. He wouldn't be seen again by the legal system for several months. At this time, Mary Ruth was pregnant with her and George's second son. They made their way to Memphis and stayed with George's brother, Clifford Jr. Then George found a job working at the Hudson Oil Company as a service station attendant. He was also receiving money from the Aid to Dependent Children program in Mississippi. Cut to August of 1969, the start of 23-year-old George Howard Putt's murder spree. George had escaped from a Mississippi prison three months before and fled the state. Now he was working at a gas station in Memphis, Tennessee. And according to George's own confessions to all five murders, court documents, eyewitness statements, and over 100 newspaper articles, here is what probably happened next. And I say probably because George would later redact his multiple confessions. Confessions that he had signed. On August 13, 1969, George murdered 58-year-old Roy Dumas and sexually assaulted and murdered Roy's wife, 47-year-old Bernalyn Dumas. According to George's confession, he had chosen the Dumases by complete chance. That day, he had gone to sell a pint of blood. Then he had a few beers at the OK Cafe. And after that, he found a random apartment building. At least one person saw George sitting outside this building. With the apartment picked at random, George knocked on the Dumas' door. Roy answered, and George pushed small-statured Roy back into the apartment and demanded money. Maybe Roy had argued with him or said he didn't have any money because George tied him up and searched for the money himself. And he found about 30 bucks in total which would be about 250 in 2023 money. At one point, according to George's initial confessions, Roy freed him from his bindings. But then George caught him and tied him to his bed once more. In the midst of all this, Roy let it slip that his wife, Bernalyn, would be home at about 3 p.m. So George waited for Bernalyn in her bedroom. When she came home from work, George jumped her with one of Roy's hunting knives and tied her up. And despite what the medical examiner would say in a 1973 trial, George himself explained that he raped her. And then he mutilated her with Roy's knife and strangled her with a stocking. Then he strangled Roy with a stocking. George took a few minutes to wipe the apartment clean of his fingerprints. Then he took Roy's knife with him and left. Eleven days later, on August 25th, George killed 82-year-old Layla Jackson. George never went to trial for Layla's murder, just for the murders of Roy, Bernalyn, and Christine. We'll get to that later, but just so you know, that's why we have fewer details here. But it's likely Layla was also picked at random, especially since it didn't appear that she ever crossed George's path. On the same day that George killed Layla, he went to a used car dealership called Amco Transmission Company. The company owner remembered selling George a 1961 white Buick station wagon. George told the owner that the Buick was for his wife, Mary Ruth. The car didn't actually run, but that was all right with George. He and his brother, Clifford Jr., could fix it up. George gave the car dealer $50 as a down payment on August 25th. 
It's not clear if he bought the car before or after he killed Layla that day. But since Layla always said she didn't keep money in her house, it wouldn't shock me if he had bought the car after he murdered Layla. It would make sense that he couldn't buy the car outright since he wasn't able to find too much money in Layla's home. Four days later, on August 29th, George killed 21-year-old Glenda Sue Harden. As I mentioned in part one, there are suspicions that Glenda Sue had left her car unlocked and that George had used that as an opportunity to get in her back seat. But maybe that's not what happened. Maybe George simply saw Glenda Sue cash her paycheck at the bank around lunchtime that day and then followed her until she was near her parked car. Like Layla, George would never go to trial for Glenda Sue's murder, so the details are hazy. After George robbed, raped, murdered, and mutilated Glenda Sue, he was seen driving her car to the parking lot where it was later discovered. At some point, he stole Glenda Sue's money and several of her belongings, including her sunglasses case, which was later found in his home. Three days later, on September 2nd, George returned to the used car dealership and paid off the rest of the station wagon. And nine days after that, on September 11th, George killed 59-year-old Christine Pickens. According to George's confessions and the testimony of several witnesses, George sold a pint of blood that day, just like he had before the Dumas's murder. Then he drank some Budweiser's at a bar from about 10.45 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. This bar was the same one George went to before the Dumas's murders, the OK Cafe, and it was walking distance from Christine's apartment. The waitress who served George chatted with him about the serial killer running loose, who was killing people with stockings. The waitress had no idea she was talking to the serial killer himself. She told the commercial appeals reporters, quote, I was teasing him about whether he had a stocking in his pocket. He just smiled. People were always kidding about things like that. After George left the OK Cafe in his car, a woman later saw him walking near Christine's apartment. According to court testimony, George first knocked on the door of the apartment next to Christine's. The resident of that apartment, Grace Oldham, testified that George said, I'm here to collect on a bad check from Oldham. When Grace asked for more information, George said it was Johnny Oldham. Grace told George to go away and she heard him leave. Then she peeked out her door and saw him go into Christine's apartment. According to George's confessions, he had seen Christine walk into her building while carrying some packages. At 1.05 p.m., he followed Christine inside her apartment. Once inside, he tried to snatch her purse, but Christine wasn't having it. She began screaming bloody murder, literally. She yelled, murderer, murderer. George stabbed her at least 14 times and slashed her throat. And despite these gruesome injuries, Christine fought back and screamed as loud as she could. She could be heard clear as day to her upstairs neighbor, Emma Gross. Emma was 57 years old, a grandmother and a nurse. She was getting ready for work that day and making herself a sandwich. But upon hearing Christine's screams, Emma dropped everything and sprinted to the source of the sound. She immediately spotted George holding a bloody knife, the same knife that George had stolen from Roy Dumas. George tried to act calm as Emma approached him as if this was a normal situation. But Emma told the commercial appeal I was so close to him, he showed me the knife and blood fell off the blade onto my uniform. Emma tried to grab George, but he pushed her away and ran, and she followed right behind him. As Emma took off after George, she saw another neighbor, 57-year-old Wayne Armstrong. Wayne was a liquor store clerk who lived across the hall from Christine. Emma yelled to Wayne, Come! Christine's been killed! Wayne burst out of his apartment wearing nothing but his boxers, and whipped out a pistol. According to one eyewitness, George paused and said, he won't shoot me in the back. To which Wayne replied, I'll shoot you in the back the same as in the front if you try to run away. But then George ran, and Wayne did fire six shots at him, but none of them made contact. So Wayne and Emma both ran after George while yelling for onlookers to call the police. Multiple people heard Wayne and Emma's pleas and joined in their pursuit of George. In a way, it was kind of poetic. George had terrorized the citizens of Memphis, and now Memphis citizens were getting their shot at terrorizing George. 
But still, he nearly got away. He was a fast runner, and he managed to hop a fence and go under a construction expressway. I'm sure by that time, many people had called the police, but there was no way the authorities were going to make it in time. Through a sheer stroke of luck, George happened to run into two police officers, R.G. Noblin and P.R. Scruggs. They stopped him because they thought something weird was going on. One later admitted that at first he thought George was an artist. Why else would someone have so much red paint on themselves? Quickly, the officers realized George was covered in blood, not paint. And finally, he was caught. It was over. He was strip searched, arrested, and charged with five counts of murder at 1.21 p.m. on September 11th, 1969, only 15 minutes after the son of a bitch murdered Christine Pickens on her own birthday. Police Chief Henry Lux said of Christine, Memphis owes this woman a debt of gratitude. If she had not put up a fight and screamed, sounding the alarm for others to hear, she might not have been discovered until long after her death and the killer would have had the chance to escape. It may sound trite, but in a sense, she gave her life so that others could escape this terror. Police Chief Lux also publicly thanked the efforts of Emma Gross, Wayne Armstrong, and the other concerned citizens who had helped chase George down. Shortly after capturing George, the police were able to recover the murder weapon, which he had tossed while he was running, and they also found his bloody white shirt, which he had taken off during the chase, too. When his arrest was announced on the police radios, the officers cheered over their walkies. Later, George would be indicted for five counts of murder in the perpetration of a robbery, two counts of carrying a hunting knife, and he was held without bail. The next day, on September 12th, the papers announced that the police had charged 23-year-old George Howard Putt, an escaped convict, with the murder of five people. The police highly suspected that this 23-year-old was their notorious cunning sex killer. George admitted to killing his victims at random when he needed money. Now that police knew George was the killer, finding the evidence to prove as much was easy. According to the FBI, his fingerprints were on Christine's apartment door. His palm print was on her purse. And of course, he had been caught in the act. It's not clear how much George's wife, Mary Ruth, and his brother, Clifford Jr., knew about George's serial killing. They both claimed to be extremely shocked. But Mary Ruth had recently paid up their rent for several weeks. And according to witnesses, Clifford Jr. had spent time with George every single day for weeks that summer and fall of 69. Naturally, Clifford Jr. had claimed that he had rarely seen George during this time but he did admit that he noticed George had been acting weird about the recent string of murders. In an interview with the Memphis Press Scimitar, Clifford said, I had a bad feeling every time I would see him. He would say, there was another murder, and I hadn't heard it on the news reports or anything. It seemed that he wanted to tell me what he had done. I knew something was wrong. He'd show me the houses where those deaths occurred. He pointed them out. And another weird thing. Less than a week after George was arrested, Clifford Jr. packed up and left for Richmond, Virginia. But in all fairness to Clifford, he said he'd lost his job at the service station due to the case. In October of 1970, 24-year-old George Putt's first jury trial began. He was accused of murdering Mary Christine Pickens in the first degree. The prosecution had chosen Christine's murder because they figured with the eyewitnesses and fingerprints, it would be the easiest to get a conviction. And they were seeking the death penalty, so hopefully they'd only have to do this process once. During the trial itself, the prosecution presented an airtight case against George. After all, the police had literally caught him red-handed. And there was so much more evidence against him. George's fingerprints were at Christine's apartment. His palm print was on her stolen purse. He had used Roy Dumas's knife as the murder weapon. The defense's arguments were not so airtight. They said George couldn't have confessed because he was too drunk from his beers at the OK Cafe. But for the record, the waitress that had served George said he seemed fine. The defense also insinuated that the signatures on George's confessions were falsified by the police. 
But that rationale didn't stick well either, especially since the prosecution read aloud George's very specific, very accurate confessions. By the end of it all, George's defense team realized the only leg they had to stand on was George's mental health. George had pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Now his attorneys had to convince the jury. Multiple psychiatrists testified to George's distorted views of women, his mental health diagnoses, and violent behavior. George's mother-in-law testified that he once walked in on her while she was having a bath. He put his hands on her shoulders and said, shh, I won't hurt you. But even though the defense's psychiatrist said George was legally insane, the prosecution's expert witnesses said otherwise. They argued that George knew right from wrong when he had killed Christine. He just hadn't cared. I bet this entire trial, from opening statements to closing, felt more like a formality than a debate. On October 27th, after two weeks of trial, approximately 50 witnesses and 47 minutes of deliberation, the jury found 24-year-old George Howard Putt guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death in the electric chair. Less than a week before George's conviction, his wife, Mary Ruth, gave birth to his second son. Following the trial, George's lawyers immediately moved for a new trial. That was denied, and then they started the appeals process. Despite the win on Christine's death penalty case, prosecutors decided to try George for the Dumas murders, lest his conviction be overturned on some technicality. The second trial began on April 23rd of 1973. George was 27 years old. The prosecution simply presented George's confessions and rested their case. And the defense, once again, argued that George was temporarily insane when he committed the murders. But this didn't hold up well. Multiple medical experts took the stand, saying George was absolutely sane during the murders. Some even indicated that George purposely tried to appear mentally ill so that he could avoid the death penalty. On April 27th, after 90 minutes of deliberation, George Howard Putt was convicted of murdering Roy and Bernalyn Dumas. He was sentenced to 497 consecutive years in prison, the longest sentence ever given in Memphis, Tennessee. But what about George's death sentence? Well, in June of 1972, the United States Supreme Court determined that the death penalty was unconstitutional. As a result, George's original sentence for the murder of Christine Pickens was changed to 99 years in prison, which was included in his total of 497 years. The United States later restored the death penalty in 1988. By 1974, George's appeals had been dismissed and his convictions upheld. He had never shown remorse for killing Roy and Bernalyn Dumas, Layla Jackson, Linda Sue Harden, or Mary Christine Pickens. He told a Memphis magazine around 1989, I think where I'm at now is where I'm supposed to be. To get where I'm at, I'd do it all again. At one point, years after his conviction, George requested a new trial yet again. He claimed that his defense counsel was ineffective. This appeal was also denied. On October 26, 2015, 69-year-old George Howard Putt died in a prison hospital in Davidson County, Tennessee. To date, his burial details remain unknown. But if you look on his find-a-grave page, one person left him poison ivy where folks usually leave virtual flowers. George Putt killed five people over a period of 29 days. He is still a serial killer rather than a spree killer, because there were cooling off periods between the murders. During that hot summer of 1969, Putt terrorized Memphis, Tennessee in a combination of robberies and sexual assaults. He preyed on older, more vulnerable women with the exception of one victim, Glenda Sue Harden. And even she seemed to be a murder of convenience. He needed money. He saw Glenda Sue and followed her to her car. Since at least the age of 15, George Putt had been brutalizing women. By the summer of 1969, he was escalating. The mutilations of his victims showed a rapist who had graduated in his savagery, while also seemingly pairing his robberies 
with the sexual assaults for convenience. And who knows how many unsolved rapes and murders could be attributed to such a violent man. A man who was assaulting women before he was even 18 years old. A man who never showed any remorse. A man who deserved to die in prison. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank, with additional writing by myself. As usual, all editorial comments are my own. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brandon Sheck Snyder of Southern Gothic and Erica Kelly. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the Listener Suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messaging, but please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern Fraud, but all kinds, but it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review. I'm on all large platforms like iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, Amazon, and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.